Do you have a good memory for the things that will make you effective in sales? How you even answer the question will tell me a lot about your memory ability. Let's get into that on today's episode of The Buyer's Mind. Welcome to The Buyer's Mind, where we take a closer look deep inside your customer's decision-making mechanism to reverse engineer the perfect sales presentation. Now, please welcome your host, Jeff Shaw. Well, greetings, everyone. Once again, welcome to The Buyer's Mind, the podcast where we want to know the way that our customer thinks. And today we're going to get into it with a really, really fascinating discussion on memory. Uh, our show producer, Paul Murphy. What do you think, Murph? Do you, do you think that you have a good memory? What, what was it? What were we doing? Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, I see what you did there. I see what you did there. Yeah. Well, what, what do you think? Do, would you have said you have a good memory? I don't have a good memory. I, it, it's really uh, perplexing to me sometimes in social situations. Somebody will introduce themselves and three seconds later, I'm like, what? What was their name? Very, very yeah, tough. Just so you know, Murph, you're, you're the only person that I've ever talked to who feels that way. Everybody else has got this figured out. Uh, no, listen, this is so common. We meet somebody, we forget their name immediately. We don't remember where we put our car keys. Uh, we, we can't remember uh, uh, phone numbers anymore because we just, I guess we don't have to do that as much as we used to. But, but there is that idea of memory, but not just our memory in our life, but memory in our role as sales professionals, remembering the things that need to be done, remembering the details of our customer's life. This is a potential game changer. And here's my promise to you. It may not be as hard as you think it is. It might be something that we can train our brains to. And that's why I wanted to have Nelson Dellis on the podcast. I, I, I want you to just not, not just listen to it and be entertained, although I think that you will be entertained. I want you to listen to it with the intention of challenging yourself and especially challenging yourself around your memory paradigm, because the quickest way to a poor memory is when you believe that you have a poor memory. And the quickest way to improving your memory is to believe that you can improve your memory. So let's get into this and challenge this very, very important topic. Well, I stumbled across Nelson Dallas. So I was watching a, a Netflix documentary. My wife and I were just sort of flipping through the channels. What do you want to see? And we saw this documentary called Memory Games and on, on memory competitions, which I have to admit, I didn't even know that was a thing. Uh, I learned a new term, memory athlete. Uh, once I watched it, then I found Nelson Dallas online and then I read his book and then I reached out and here we are. He, he's a four-time winner of the USA Memory Championship. He's competed all over the world. He's a record holder in a number of memory categories. This is an example. The man can memorize a deck of cards in under 40 seconds. Uh, I have no idea. Um, he's also an avid mountain climber. He's an activist in the fight against Alzheimer's. Uh, he has an excellent and very informative uh, YouTube channel. He's also the author of the book, Remember It, The Names of the People You Meet, All of Your Passwords, Where You Left Your Car Keys, and Everything Else You Tend to Forget, a book that I read very quickly in the last couple of weeks and now will reread very slowly as something of a text uh, textbook. In his spare time, he's an in-demand keynote speaker joining us from Miami, Florida, Nelson Dallas. Nelson, how are you, sir? Hey, Jeff. I'm great. How are you? Good. I'm just, I'm tired just reading your bio. Do you, do you feel like you read a crazy life or is this all just kind of normal to you at this point? I mean, at this point, I, I feel like it's, 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 it is boring, but, uh, uh, that's cause I've heard it a million times. Uh, and it's stuff I'm super passionate about. So it doesn't really sound like anything too crazy, but I, I, I get that that might sound like there's a lot going on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm sure everyone starts with the same question, um, or some version of the question, how much of a genius do you have to be in order to be a four-time memory champ? But having read your book, I'm guessing your opinion would be that the question itself is flawed, that there's there's no connection between our natural mental girth, if you will, and what yep. you and others like you uh, have accomplished. I, I was really interested to see, quite frankly, how normal you are. Yeah, yeah. You know, I'm surprised even that I'm a four-time champion. If you mm -hmm. look back 10 years ago, uh, this would not have been something I ever thought that I would be a master of. And, uh, I learned very quickly once I got into the world that it is something that anybody can pick up. 
And if you practice, you know, just like any other skill, you can master it. But but there has to be something of a passion, right? I mean, you, you still have to yes. enjoy it, right? Yeah, well, so, and if, you're, if you don't enjoy it, you're not going to do it every day. You know, that's, right, that's, right. that's with anything. So for me, it just happened to strike the right note. I saw the mm -hmm. benefits of it and it really helped me during that time and still to this day. And that's what made me stick with it. So, so in your experience, as you've talked to a lot of people about this, is it something that everyone would probably enjoy if they really chose to embrace it? Or is it more like, you know, learning to water ski or, or, or skydive, it's enticing to you or it's not? I think it's the way you approach it because, mm -hmm. you know, we all have a memory. We all use it from a day to day on a day to day basis. So, um, but the, the problem is, is most people hear memory and they, think of like paint drying, right? It's mm -hmm. tedious, boring. I don't want to do that every day. Right. Um, but what you can do is if you, first of all, if you learn the techniques, you can learn ways that make it a lot more enjoyable doing it the right way. It's, it's boring and painful to most people memorizing that is, um, because they're doing it wrong. And when you mm -hmm. learn how to do it right, it's actually a lot of fun and you get hooked on this feeling of it being a superpower. Yeah. And then to keep, yeah. to keep it going, it's, it's just about, you know, memorizing stuff that you want to memorize. Don't force yourself to do something that you don't want to, you know? Yeah. So part of your task then I would think is to undo some of the experiences that so many of us had you know, sitting in a Spanish class, conjugating verbs, you know, and, right. and, or just, you know, sitting there and say, okay, let's see here. Washington, Adams, Jefferson, yeah. Monroe. Cool. You know, that gives me the that... jeebies. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's boring, right? It's boring yeah. and it's frustrating because you can't, I mean, you can't win. It, it's, it's, uh, you got to work really, really hard to memorize uh, most of the stuff you learn in school. I think it's one of the reasons why people don't like school very much. I know. Yeah. And that, that's, that's some of the battles that I face trying to kind of spread what I've learned and, and taught myself, uh, because I feel like everybody should know this, this should be taught in schools from day one. And it's not mm -hmm. for whatever reason, um, yeah. because I think it would change the whole experience. Right. Yeah. Uh, let me ask you, how much, when I'm thinking about one of the things I really enjoyed in reading the book and even watching your YouTube channel, uh, is that my thought going in here was that, okay, I'm going to memorize a deck of cards and however long that's going to take, you know, it takes you 40 seconds. My guess is it'll take me slightly longer than that, but how much of that is a parlor trick? Uh, but then I read the book and I said, wow, this is really highly applicable to our day to day life, just to remembering stuff that would improve our life. I'm, uh, I assume that you're a practitioner of this, not just a, a, comp a competitor in this field. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, the competition itself, the, the different events, there, cards, memorizing numbers, names was just a means for me to measure my improvement as I trained every day. Obviously the ultimate goal is to be able to use my memory in real life for anything on the go on the fly. Right. Um, but it's, it's hard to train for that, right? Like what would I do every day to make sure that I'm ready to memorize anything in the real world? That's hard to think of. So being able to train the different events of these competitions. Yeah. They're very specialized. Like when am I ever going to memorize a deck of cards to survive, you know? Um, mm -hmm. but the techniques that go, the fundamentals of those techniques, um, live within each of those different kinds of memory tasks. And that's what I'm really practicing when I do that. Yeah. You, you know, it, when having watched the, uh, the documentary, Talk a little bit about, if you would, the the these yeah. major international competitions. I mean, I, I'm the level of focus was so intense. You saw people with, you know, they got that noise canceling headphones. Yeah. One young lady had a, a a white piece of paper that she had sort of shoved up in front of a visor so that <laughs> she could. She had I mean, it was like a sensory blinders, deprivation yeah. right there. Exactly. Yeah. Talk a little yeah. about the competition itself. What it's like to go up against uh, just really the elite memory athletes in the world. Yeah, it's fascinating. I mean, you see people from everywhere, um, all the different countries around the world. And, you know, right now, you, you, the, the superpower of memory is Mongolia. And they have these schools where they're just training and churning out these young kids that can memorize the pants off of anything. It's, it's mm -hmm. ridiculous. Um, but being at these competitions, it's three days long. It's hours and hours a day of just memorizing and recalling uh, different things. And, it's stressful and, and it, it demands a lot of mental power, mostly because of the focus that you have to put into it for hours at a time. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's, it's, it's thrilling, man. I mean, you see people around you breaking records, doing stuff that, you know, even the trained 
professional that I am, uh, I'm still amazed by every time I go. And, and you're seeing the, not the smartest people in the world, but the people in the world who have the best memories. It's, it's incredible. It was really something. And, and you mentioned Mongolia. Of course, the documentary follows the life of a young lady from uh, Mongolia who yep. uh, just really, really surprised. Because again, she's just such a normal person. She could have been my kid's Super babysitter, normal, yeah. right? You know, uh -huh, uh, yeah. but but when you look at what she did, now she said something in the documentary that that was really interesting. I'm, I'd love to hear your take on it. She said, it, this, is, this stuff is much harder to explain than it is to do. Yeah. Yeah. I think I, I, I love that line that she says, and I've, I've, I'll be honest, I've used it before because it's perfect. It's easier yeah. done than said, right? That's yeah. what she said. Right. That's um, what that's she said. Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, and it's true because I, sometimes I explain the techniques and, and people are like, well, it sounds like you're taking a detour or the long way. Why not just go about it like usual, repeat it, you know, review it over and over again. And while that may feel like the right thing, it's a bit counterintuitive when you do it and you try what I'm telling you, the techniques behind it, you just see how much easier it is. It's, it's what our brains are designed to prefer in terms of information input. And uh, it's not obvious that that's the case. So you just kind of have to do it, believe it, and then you'll be like, oh yeah, that works. I'm gonna keep doing this. Do you think it's more that I don't think I can do that? I just don't think I'm gifted enough to do that? Or do you think it's more that we've just become used to the fact that we are gonna forget stuff and that's just what humans do? You know, it's, it's maybe a mix of both. Um, mm -hmm. I've seen, so I've been in situations where, you know, I've seen people more accepting of the fact that, you know, they are just not going to have a good memory. Um, mm -hmm. Even knowing that here I am, Nelson, trained my memory. Um, they'd rather believe that, you know, this is something that I just have um, so that they don't have the excuse to um, that. What are the, why aren't they training? You know? Um, but unfortunately that's the way it is. Just people accept what, you know, they see around them and, and it's, it's not the case. I mean, memory is something that you can tweak and form to how you want it to be like any other skill or, um, or, or subject that you want to improve in. You just got to put a little of el elbow grease on it and, and, and you can, you can improve it. So you must get frustrated then if you're sitting next to somebody on an airplane and the subject comes up and they, they just say, Oh, you know what? I, I don't care what you say. I just don't have a good memory. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, well, you know, I actually welcome those people because, uh, I can give them a little example and walk them through an exercise and immediately prove them wrong. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah. and, and, that, and that's honestly what I do in my, my seminars. I, I, I start off with something like that to kind of kick that notion out the door. Like, cause if I ask who in here thinks they have a bad memory, 90% of people raise their hand, you know? Right. And yeah. I got to dispel that really quickly because if you believe that, then you're hurting yourself, you know, and it's really hard to get over that hump. So, um, because it's a self kind of defeating thing, um, right. Right. Not believing in your memory is kind of the worst killer of memory. Um, if you have confidence in your memory and you have techniques now to help support it and your memory is on fire, you know, and I'm looking at the application into the sales world and the opportunity to, just to be able to remember names, to be able to remember details about their life, to remember the small things that uh, that we can attach on to this this growing uh, portrait, right, uh, of, yeah. of what we know about uh, how valuable this is going to be uh, over time. It's incredible. And and so we got some work to do. So let's get into that. I want to start with just a, sure. a sort of a, a premise here for something that you talk about uh, a lot in your book and on your videos the concept that we think in pictures, that it's easier to remember a picture than it is to remember a fact, a number, a digit, uh, whatever it happens to be. What causes pictures to be far more memorable than facts? Yeah, you know, I think all, all the stuff that we're using in these competitions and memory techniques are based on how our brains were designed. As a species, what, however you want to define it, um, you know, uh, natural selection, whatever it was to help us survive. And back in the day before our, our, our very, very far ancestors, before we even had formal languages and, you know, any kind of writing or anything like that, we're making decisions based on what we see. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. and these are life or death decisions. You know, it, it could be as simple as a bad example, but you know, looking at a plant and recognizing that it is safe to eat versus poisonous. Right. 
Um, that is a picture that we're seeing and interpreting uh, for our survival. And that is, I think, at our very primal parts of our brain, um, what works the best. You know, fast forward thousands and thousands of years, now you have um, us coming up with languages, ideas, eventually philosophy, right? Really abstract notions and thoughts, mathematics, um, you know, all these things come along and that's relatively new for our brains. And that's why things like numbers, names, um, you know, very abstract kind of words are not so easy to, 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 to remember, but show somebody a series of pictures. And even without thinking about it, our brains can naturally absorb that. There was a study done. I, I believe I could be incorrect, but at, um, university of Florida, uh, where they showed subjects about 10,000 photos, kind of rapid succession. And then they were tested on pairs of photos and they had to say which one um, they had seen and which one they hadn't. Um, and I believe going through those, the, the results that were correct were about 98%, right? Hmm. Think about that. 10,000 photos. You're not really mm-hmm. trying to memorize anything. You're just looking right. Yeah. And to be able to recall correctly, which one you'd seen before you recognize to 98%, that's incredible. And it says something. Yeah. Yeah. I remember reading once a, a story, a, a study about showing photos to infants and getting their immediate reaction uh, to people who were yelling, for example, or or to a scary animal. And they didn't have this isn't like they learned it in a nursery rhyme. Right. But instinctively yeah. they, they get that. But you show them the letter eight and it's like, what's what it's an I don't even know what that is. So yeah. it, there, there is something, I think, deep down into our, our DNA that uh, that supports that. And when you're in your memory competitions now, you're using that and, and not just in your competitions, but in day to day life, you're using pictures all the time. I assume that that's universal for everyone who is a memory athlete. They're they're translating facts and figures figures and data into pictures. Correct. That's the first step is encode whatever you're memorizing into a picture. Um, and, and, and to add to that, and, and this goes back to, you know, showing photographs to an infant or to anybody, a picture is worth a thousand words, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, mm-hmm. in, in a way it's really a picture is worth a thousand, let's say emotions and other memories. Maybe that's more accurate. Um, mm-hmm. You know, you see a detailed photo of someone or some place there are so many little details that colors, you know, feelings, uh, locations, whatever that will pull from your own experiences and make you feel something or think of something else. And that's really the the hook for these kind of images. When you some, see something very bland, like a, a, a number, the letter eight inscribed on a piece of paper or, you know, some complex word, just the letters that doesn't mean anything. It's, mm-hmm. it's what, um, the, the the images that you can come up with for those things evoke that make it stick. So we're mm-hmm. actually encoding all of this kind of visual information um, into our minds to make it feel, uh, to make us feel something and to make us think of other things that make us feel, you know, it's, it's memories kind of a collective um, it's a collection of all the experiences and thoughts that we've ever had. So you got to tap into that to remember something new. In the book, you talk about this process, this see, link, go process. I want to just talk really briefly yeah. about each of those. Um, uh, and one of the things that I loved is in the way that you write the book, it's not just that there is a lot of great tips and and strategies and systems to be able to remember stuff. But I have to say, and my thanks to you, you're, you're very encouraging in the book. You, you wrote the book in a very encouraging tone, like oh, good. you you, you, you can do this. You don't have to you don't have to be <laughs> Mensa to try and figure this out. So so not let's walk all. through yeah. the, the three steps, uh, starting with C, give us the brief definition of, of what you mean by C. So C means take what you're memorizing and see it in your mind, right? Turn it into a picture and to be a little more specific, it doesn't necessarily mean to just like, imagine like you're seeing a, you know, picture of it in your head. Seeing means you're experiencing it. Imagine that, right. And all the senses that would go into it. Oh, if I was trying to picture a pizza, don't just see that circle with cheese on it in your head. Imagine what it would taste like if you picked up a slice. Is it hot? Is it going to scald your tongue? Does it smell delicious or does it smell rancid because it's been sitting out for days, right? Imagine the texture of the flour under your fingers. 
um, the color, the richness, is there like a, a browning burning a, a burn on the on top of the cheese, right? The, the grease is dripping from the pepperoni slices. Like that is what I mean by seeing. And, and I'm sure already the listeners, by me saying those things, you can really, you really feel like you're having a pizza, you know, at that point, you're almost yeah. salivating. It's so visual, right? And that's that was, the goal. That, but that was really intriguing and insightful, I think, right there, Nelson, because even there you said, okay, imagine a pizza. So what do I do? In my mind, okay, here's a circle with some cheese on it. And then every step that you took me through uh, a br- built a, a richer picture, and then that's going to become far more memorable. So I assume that a big part yeah. of this is the more vivid that you can see something, uh, the more memorable it'll become in the long run. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's exactly it. And I have more tips on how to expand even that, uh, in the book, but that's the general idea. All right. Link. What is it? What does it mean to link link? So once you have a picture, what do you do with it? Right? So imagine, uh, your brain is kind of like, uh, an office, right? And right now your untrained mind, when you learn something new or you hear someone's name or you're trying to learn a language, whatever, all that new information is on a piece of paper and it's just thrown in there, right? On the floor. So when you want to go get it and re- use it, recall it, whatever, you know, you're scrambling to look through all these papers that are a mess on your floor in your office. Um, but what if you could organize that all, right? What if there was a bunch of different file cabinets, all labeled nicely and organized? And if you wanted to recall something specific, you just, you know, lick your thumb and you, you know, spin through all those, um, uh, different file folders and, and, and pull out the thing you want. Right. Um, so that's what linking is. It's, it's finding a way to organize all those pictures in your mind. And I use the word link because the way we learn, the way we can attach things or file things into our mind is by linking it or attaching it to things that are already there. That's how our brain works. You know, um, great teachers will teach by example, you know, and metaphor. And that's because you're relating something very complex to something or new to something that you are already familiar with. So there are different strategies to, to, to link. Um, but the, the general idea is try to associate it. People might be more familiar with that word, um, to something that's already planted in your mind. And again, the crazier you can make that connection, the weirder or the over the top, um, you can do that. You can link it. Then the more it'll stick and the easier it will be to recall it. So when I was lying in bed a couple of nights ago and it dawned on me that I have to make a dermatology appointment that it's, I'm a little bit overdue but I didn't want to get up and write it down. And so I used a technique from the book that I think falls under the category of a link. You can tell me I have in my, in my uh, nightstand drawer, I've got like this uh, back scratcher. It's an, it's an extendable back scratcher. And uh, I, 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 like a telescoping thing. I, I took it out and I just tossed it on the floor so that when I got up in the morning, I would see it there. So that's not only the get something out of place, but it was my back scratcher, which means uh, I scratched my back. I scratched my skin. Oh, yeah, make an appointment to the dermatologist. Did I do that right? Are you proud of me? Yeah, that's awesome. That's that's one of the techniques that I outlined in my book. I call it the throw the pen method. Yeah, you just take something because part of that technique is the beauty of it is, is you're kind of externalizing um, a memory. You're mm-hmm. storing it kind of on that piece of whatever you throw there in your case, a back scratcher. Um, and it's kind of actually physically located there, but also Mm -hmm. in your mind mentally mapped there too. Mm -hmm. And you're going to run into that thing in the morning anyway. So when you search for what you're trying to remember, it'll be attached to that, uh, or links to that back scratcher. Love it. See link go. What is go? So go is the final step. It's kind of the magic glue that brings that together, right? You've pictured something, you have a place, or thing that you're going to attach it to. And then go is how you squash that all together. And it's kind of implied in, in how I've already described um, everything so far, but it's, it's basically making sure that that image, that association, however you link it together, uh, really uh, goes for it. Like um, in the book, it's see link go with an exclamation mark. So you really want to make an exclamation point on that um, association and add the color, add the smell, add the, action, give it some movement, emotion. How does it make you feel? Does it tap into some kind of, um, sadness, funniness, um, anger, all those things are things that will, um, bring that memory to life. 
I know everyone, me included, uh, wants to ask about how to remember names. My guess is that you probably get this uh, all the time. I know you have specific techniques for that, uh, techniques, by the way, that I'm already, already trying to uh, work on. But you suggest in your books, uh, in your book and in your videos, mm -hmm. that the mindset, that the intentionality of remembering names is actually far more important than the skill set. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah, definitely. And that... that ties into what we talked earlier in this call is that if somebody's, you know, quote unquote, bad with names, um, then you're going to be bad with names. You know, I uh, can't help you. I'm sorry. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but if, if you turn that around into, okay, I'm going to try, right. Just even that uh, you'll be surprised what you can do. And then add to that a bit of that ceiling go. Um, and then suddenly you're a name remembering God or goddess. So, mm -hmm. um, you'd be surprised how much memory confidence uh, plays into actually memorizing, you know, there's as an athlete in the sport, it's, it's common to go into a slump, you know, and you're hitting plateaus, you can't better your scores or you keep losing for some reason or performing bad for whatever reasons. And of course, like anybody that would make you think twice and, and, and your self-confidence in, 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 in your memory goes down. So that furthermore makes your memory kind of on the edge. So you have to try and when I find ways to kind of break those cycles and, or if I find myself in kind of a, a really good rhythm, I feel like my brain is unstoppable. Some of my best training scores or performances at competitions, I almost felt like I wasn't trying as, as silly as that sounds. I'd look at a deck of cards and I'm, I, I'm almost asking myself, man, I don't even know what I'm doing, but this feels good. And, uh, that kind of self-confidence just makes it the easiest thing in the world to do. So the bottom line is, is, is if you want to be, be better at remembering names, just start with making the effort and then mm -hmm. trying to change that narrative to I'm bad at name uh, from I'm bad at names to, Hey, maybe I have some decent skills at memori memorizing names. And then eventually right. maybe that turns into, I am awesome at names. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right, right. So if you if you got the mindset right that even at your hey, I'm gonna try, I'm really going to pay because let's face it, if I'm in a sales environment, somebody walks through the door and says, My name is Robert Smith. I've got a briefcase with a million dollars in it. I'm gonna hand it to you in thirty minutes. You just need to make sure you can recite my name before I do. You're probably going to remember Robert Smith. So, you know, yeah. sometimes it's just that motivation to want to remember in the first place, that's going to make all the difference in the world. And that's very encouraging to me because I think I am that person who would say, boy, I'm really, really bad at names. I think if I'm being honest, I'd probably better be better served to look back and say, uh, I'm not bad at names. Uh, I'm, I'm bad at trying to remember names, not a remembering that's names, like at right. trying remembering <laughs> names. Yeah. Right? Yeah. 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 And I, and again, it's, it's, some people are just almost, they find it's almost easier to accept that they're better bad at names than to actually try, which is, which is sad because it's actually not that hard to remember names. And that, that example with a million dollars is amazing because that's just this, that's just a mindset thing. And if, mm -hmm. what, what if you told yourself, Hey, I'm going to imagine that everybody I meet has a million dollar briefcase mm -hmm. that even that little thought alone will change your, your frame of mind. Um, and, and you'll just see the, the difference instantly. I want to ask about your your work in fighting Alzheimer's. That certainly struck a chord with me first on in the documentary, and then as I was reading the book, I lost my mother to an Alzheimer's battle. It was not fun. Oh, well. It is something that I'm really, really hoping uh, that uh, you know medically we can uh, figure this out. That that research will be able to figure this out uh, here in the very near future because it's just so difficult to watch a loved one go down that path. It's different, uh, difficult on the caregivers uh, as well. Sure. But you went through this experience and it, it, it clearly uh, struck an emotional chord with you. Yeah. You know, it, that's what got me started on this journey. I uh, watched my grandmother lose her mind, so to speak. And mm -hmm. it was horrible to watch and actually really enlightening and, and fascinating at the same time that that could happen to a person. And I definitely did not want that to happen to me and mm -hmm. made me think twice about brain health and, and what I was doing now and what it means to have a healthy mind. I'd never even thought about that concept before that point. Uh, along those lines of having that healthy mind, um, are, are you 
do you suppose that the work that you have done over the time to not just memorize things, but along those lines, when you're trying to connect through pictures, when you're trying to add uh, emotion to it, all of the senses to it, you're firing so many different parts of the brain. Do you believe that you're increasing the number of neural pathways in your brain and that that might actually at some point help you to have a healthier brain, not just a better memory, but a healthier brain for a longer period of time? Yeah, I, I personally do. Um, and you know, I've, I've been a part, look, been lucky to be a part of some studies that have, um, used scanners to look into my head. And, um, you see exactly that, that when I'm doing these things, my whole brain is lighting up. I'm using all of it versus somebody who's trying to memorize something. You'd like to see one small portion of the brain light up and I'm doing this all day long. You know, I'm not always memorizing things, but I'm always thinking about things that come my way information. Uh, in a frame of mind as if I'd like to memorize it. And and that's all the difference. And I really feel like I'm using all of my brain and the brain's like a muscle. If you're going to pump it up all day long, you better believe it's going to be this big bulging hunky piece of meat. That's able to do tons of things, you know, right. for a long right. time. Sure. Uh, just about out of time here, but you don't sit still very well, do you? What's next for Nelson Dellis? <laughs> Um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, I don't know. I'm, I'm just finishing a, a kid's version of, uh, my remember it book, which okay. will be out next year. Uh, I'm very it. excited about that. And then, um, yeah, just riding the wave of this, uh, Netflix special and seeing what's coming next. I'm on a few shows this year and next, and we'll see. That's cool. And then you have a keynote speaking career at the same time. You're, you're talking to groups and organizations and, uh, telling, Correct them your story and uh yeah that's 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 awesome all right before we let you go yeah. just a little tradition here on the uh podcast we're going to put you on the hot seat rapid fire questions rapid okay. fire answers ready great yep go here we go all right your very first job was what uh, i was a pizza delivery no sorry before that i was a vet tech <laughs> okay uh an album from your youth that you listen to over and over again Oh my God. Uh, tool lateralis. <laughs> uh, th this is going to be an intriguing one for you. The most beautiful place you've ever stood. Oh man. Um, well, I, I, as you said, I like to climb mountains. Um, right. so I, I'm trying to think of which part of a mountain I, I yeah. love to stand. I, this, this one sticks out of my head is the, the final Ridge on, uh, Mount McKinley mm. uh, or Denali near the top. Right. You're above the clouds, nothing around you. It's, it's one of the most beautiful ridges in the world. Wow. Uh, it, uh, any book that you read early in life that has a profound impact on the rest of your life? Yes. Um, I actually was doing a YouTube video about this, recording it today. Um, one of my favorite books that kind of changed everything for me was a book called Girdle, Escher, and Bach, An Eternal Golden Braid. And uh, it's a pretty complicated title, but it's all about music, math, and the mind and machines. And it's very, um, it's, it's loosely based around kind of an Alice in Wonderland crazy feeling, but the, the guy who wrote it was a computer scientist. So it's, it's really impressively challenging and, and thought provoking. It, it really changed the game for me. Love it. Uh, a movie you've seen multiple times, doesn't matter when it comes on, you have to watch it again. <laughs> uh, Step Brothers. Uh. Okay. And uh, your, your first celebrity crush. Oh man. Um, it might've been like Penelope Cruz or something there like that. Go. Yeah. It's a I'm solid choice. The Spaniard. You yeah. <laughs> you're off the hot seat. Uh, there you have it. Nelson Dallas, uh, four time USA memory champion, uh, author of the book. Remember it just a phenomenal book. You can get it on, uh, Amazon, um, mountain climber, Alzheimer's activist, and a really, really interesting guy. And if you're looking for somebody to speak to your organization, you can find him at Nelson And, uh, that's uh, Nelson Dellis, D E L L I S. We'll put that in the show notes as well. Nelson, I can't thank you enough. That was so fascinating. Everything I was hoping, for in the conversation. I really enjoyed that. Awesome. Yeah, it was a pleasure speaking with you. I hope your listeners took away a lot. Thanks. Murph, I'm I'm mentally tired now. <laughs> How are you feeling? It's something I won't forget. I'll put it that way. Yeah. <laughs> oh, good. Where's the rim shot when we need it? You, you got to edit in a rim shot on that one right there. Uh, um, boy, that was really, really good stuff. And uh, he just the way he speaks... 
I, I don't know about you, but to me, it just it gives me a, a sense of confidence that this is something that can't be done, right? It's not something that's just sort of, you know, out there for the geniuses, but it's something that, that could be worked on. Well, and I hadn't even heard of him before until you shared him with us. Mm -hmm. And so now I'm inspired yeah. to go out and find the book and read it myself because uh, uh, we yeah. could all uh, learn to have a little bit of a better memory. Yeah, absolutely. And I just want to challenge everybody who's listening, even if you don't um, uh, read the book right away, if you go to his YouTube channel, just just watch one YouTube, just any one that you like. What, what He's got a whole list uh, and there are all these random tips, but they're highly applicable right away. And I would just challenge you, go there, just find one, just find one and just say, I'm going to run with that. I'm going to work with that for a day in my sales office and, and just see how it works for you. But just think about the message you're sending to your customer because nothing says I care more than I remember. And I remember the details of your life. And why? Because they were important to me. So that's where we have a huge opportunity to stand apart from everybody else that's out there. Great conversation with Nelson Dellis, and he's helping to change the world. We'll talk to you next time.